If someone gave you 10 million bucks, tax-free, what's the first thing you would do? At some point, everyone has that daydream, or one like it. That's why finding money, stealing money, making money, spending money is the subject of countless movies and TV shows. Our society continually thinks and talks about money. You don't get frustrated when songs, movies, or TV shows talk about money. But some people get uncomfortable when we talk about money in church. That really doesn't make sense. Why don't people want to hear about money at church? Probably it's the same reason people don't want to hear about any sin at church. They don't enjoy conviction. If you're disobeying God in the area of your finances, it's uncomfortable to hear it addressed. Or if you've really messed up in this part of your life, it's tough to think about everything you wish you'd done different. If I talk about sex, I make people who are committing sexual sin uncomfortable. When I talk about gossips, I make the gossips mad. When I talk about money, people who struggle in that area don't enjoy it. I decided long ago I would not avoid uncomfortable truths just to avoid criticism. We'll deal with the difficult issues. We'll talk about sex, we'll talk about gossip, and we'll talk about money. The Bible had a lot to say on the subject. Jesus had a lot to say about money. In fact, he talked more about money than about heaven and hell combined because he knew this was an area where people would struggle and struggle to obey. We're looking at biblical principles for money management. And my goal is that you will think about and approach money different than others around you. I want you to experience the blessings of God and in turn be a blessing. Culture teaches principles that sound good and feel good for a moment, but ultimately will land you in trouble. Things like, you can have it all right now. There's no need to wait. Easy credit is the answer to every problem. If you buy the right things, people will respect you and your neighbors will envy you. You need more, better, newer, faster. You deserve more, better, newer, and faster. If that doesn't work, that doesn't satisfy, there's never enough. There's a better way to live. Let's, let's review where we're at so far. The follow the leader principle says, if you don't follow the right leader, you'll end up in the wrong place. Base your financial decisions on the Bible. Simon says principle, obey what God says in regards to your money. If you, obey, if you ignore his voice and his instruction, you lose. The you are here principle says you won't make lasting changes until you first face reality. The Sam Walton principle, learn the secret of disciplined living. Too many people live above their means. Their expenses exceed their income. Reverse that and live below your means. The piggy bank principle, plan and save for the future. Intentional saving early in life can set you up for later in life, and it's never too late to start. The Veruca Salt principle is the opposite of Veruca and her I want it now. It's delayed gratification, which means I'll sacrifice now and I'll get it later. The happy and you know it principle is the in principle of internal satisfaction that says I can be happy with who I am and what I have. I don't have to compare and I don't have to compete. The birthday party principle reminds you to celebrate every once in a while. Plan incremental rewards. And the library principle acknowledges that everything you have comes from God. You are not the owner, you're a steward. You are managing what God has trusted to your care. Now I want to teach you four more principles. Your children are learning the same thing. I encourage you, talk about it together. There's cards at the table in the lobby that you can use to play the memory game with your kids. As you turn over the cards, talk about the principles and learn together. Let's raise a generation that approaches money in a healthy way. I wasn't uh, popular in grade school and junior high. Well, I wasn't popular with students, but my teachers loved me. 
I can't tell you how many times I was called teacher's pet. In the old days, teacher's pet brought an apple to a teacher. Now if you did that, the teacher would have it tested before she ate it. Anyway, teacher's pet gets a lot of grief from other students. Everybody wants the teacher to like them, and when you're not the favorite and someone else is, that makes you mad. The teacher's pet principle is the principle of positioning for blessing. Someone becomes the teacher's pet because of the way they act and the work they do makes the teacher want to bless them. With their actions and their attitudes, they position for blessing. In the same way, with your actions and decisions regarding your money, you position yourself for a blessing or for a curse. Psalms 112 said, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds great delight in his commands. His children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for the gracious and compassionate and righteous man. Good will come to him who is generous and lends freely, who conducts his affairs with justice. Surely he will never be shaken. A righteous man will be remembered forever. He will have no fear of bad news. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is secure. He'll have no fear. In the end, he'll look with triumph on his foes. He's scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be lifted high in honor. Now that is some awesome blessings. And just like a teacher's pat, some people resent others' blessings. They may not be foolish enough to say it out loud, but they think, come on, God, why won't you, spend it? Why won't you spread it around a little? It must be nice to be rich. Why do they always get everything? What have they done to deserve it? I don't understand. When is it my turn? You look at what you see. You see someone's wealth or possessions, and you forget that each person has the opportunity to position themselves for blessing. It's a choice. Now, I have to tell you, in too many churches, this has been abused by money-hungry preachers trying to line their own pockets by manipulating naive people. This is not a slot machine religion. If someone guarantees you a tenfold or a hundredfold or a thousandfold return on your money, don't be fooled. Run from them. They're lying to you. God promises blessings, but I can't promise you the percentage of the amount. And God's blessings aren't always financial. I mean, look back at the list we just read. Financial blessings are part of it, but they are far from all of it. There are many ways God blesses you. So how do you position yourself for God's blessings? We find the answer in a familiar passage of Scripture. Will a man rob God? You rob me. And you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you're robbing me. Under a curse is the exact opposite of positioning yourself for blessing. Bring the whole tithe in the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. See if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, you won't have room enough for it. So people ask all the time, how much should I give? Well, the minimum you should give is the tithe. Tithing is giving 10% of your income to God. The thought of giving 10% may scare you, but let me show you how smart tithing is. Tithing is saying, God, everything I have belongs to you. So God, I have 10 of your dollars. What do you want me to do with these $10? And God says, I want you to give me one. You say, God, just one? What about the other nine? Well, you can keep those. God, that's not fair. It's all yours. I should at least give you two. And God's saying, I just want one. You want one out of the ten. I get to keep the nine. That's it. Just one. Well, I should at least give you three. Do whatever you want. One's what I require. That's like being somebody's financial manager, and you get 90% as a fee. They give you $100,000, you keep $90,000, and only invest $10,000. That's an unbelievable deal. He's God. He could say, I want 70%. He could say, I want 90%, and you live off 10%. 
But the biblical pattern is you invest one out of every $10 in his kingdom and you keep the rest. Tithing is just part of the deal. That's what kingdom people do. You say, but Rod, I make $100,000 a year. Do you know how much money that is? Yeah, I can do math. But you get to keep 90%. Remember, it's not your money. The library principle, you're not an owner. It all belongs to God. You're just a steward. So be a wise steward and position yourself for God's blessings. Do you know what's interesting to me? The studies agree. It's consistent. The less money you have, the higher percentage you give. And the more money a person has, the less percentage they give. You know why? Because they get enamored with the amount of dollars. So you look at someone and you say, well, he's rich. His tithe must be a lot of money. Well, it would be if he gave it. Chances are you're giving just as much or more than him. It's not about amounts. It's about percentages. See, some people think tithing waits till you get older or tithing waits till your school loans are paid off or when you get out of debt. They say, well, I will obey when, which never leads to obeying. Start where you are right now, today. Average church person in America gives only about 2.5% of their income to God. 2.5%. And we wonder why the church is losing influence in society. Let's start right here. The church in America is walking in disobedience to God. Why would we think a disobedient church would be influential and a force in society? Your tithe, the first 10% of your income to God, positions you for blessing. And you still have to wise, make wise decisions. Tithing doesn't negate stupidity. But all the other principles hinge on this one. Obedience to God positions you for blessing. Paul said it this way. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Your obedience to God positions you for blessing. It's foolish to expect the blessings minus the obedience. Then, what should be your response to God's blessing? It's interesting, but we miss this so often. You obey God, he pours out his blessing, and then you take the credit for it. Now, you don't say, I did this without God. Instead, you talk about your good ideas, your hard work, your brilliant leadership. But James says, every good and perfect gift is from God. It's from God. The thank you principle is the principle of gratefully receiving from others and from God. And I just want to stop and say, many of you are not good at this. You do not receive blessings or compliments well. And it frustrates me. I'll compliment someone and say, nice dress. And they'll say, this dress? I bought it at Target. Or they'll say, this old thing? I hate this dress. And when you do that, you know what I want to say? I want to say, okay, I was lying. I hate it too. It's horrible. It makes you look 50 pounds heavier. Why would you ever wear that? (laughs) Just learn to say thank you. Gratefully receive the compliment or the blessing. When I graduated from high school, I got a bunch of gifts. I didn't want to write all those thank you cards, but my mom taught me when someone does something or says something nice, you say thank you. Acknowledge the gift, acknowledge the giver. In the same way, thank God for your blessings. That's part of acknowledging the fact that he owns it all. I do it when I walk and pray. I like to start my prayer time by thanking God. I thank him for my family, for my home. I thank him for air conditioning, for a healthy church, for people who love me, for a team I trust. I thank him, glory to God, thank you, Jesus, for my new granddaughter. I can tell you, I've prayed a lot of thank you prayers the last couple days. Thank God for his blessings. Thank him. Let's look at some other practical ways you can honor God with your money. Proverbs 8, 6. Or 6, 6. I'm sorry. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander or overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. When I was a kid, I always wanted an ant farm. 
Always. That's like the one thing I wanted. When you sold, you know, 10,000 candy bars at school, you could get an ant farm. My mom would never let me have it because she doesn't like ants. Always wanted an ant farm. From this verse comes the smarter than an ant principle. An ant has a tiny little brain. An ant brain has about 250,000 brain cells. Your brain, well, most of you, have about 100 billion brain cells. Do you realize what that means? It takes a colony of 400,000 ants to collectively have the same size brain as you. You're smart. Doesn't that make you feel better? But even with its tiny little brain, an ant's wise enough to store food for when it's needed. The ant knows, I'm going to need this later. So even though I don't feel like it, even though it's not fun, I'm going to find food. I'm going to put it away for the future. An ant has clearly determined priorities. The smarter than an ant principle is the principle of determined priorities. To set your financial course, you must first determine your priorities. Your priorities, what you want, determine your path, what you do. So Cindy and I decided before we ever had children that we wanted to be able to pay for their college. Now I understand not every parent has that priority. That's up to you. For us, that was a priority. Priority determines path. So since that was a priority, our path was clear determined by that priority. Even though we could afford an upgrade, we lived in the same house for 15 years. A bigger house wasn't our priority. College was. I drove a 1988 Honda Civic. Man, I loved that car. Isn't that a great looking car? For about 12 years. I skipped the decade of the 90s. Cindy drove an 86 Honda Accord for 11 years that we bought used. Could we have upgraded cars? Yes, but it wasn't our priority. Priority determines path we needed to save for college. That Civic right there became famous. You couldn't, you couldn't hurt it. Couldn't get rid of it. Couldn't kill it. One day I was playing golf at North Hills. I left the car unlocked, the windows down, and the keys in the ignition. And sure enough, when I was playing golf, I got robbed. Back then, I left gas money in the armrest. They took the $60 of gas money and left the car. <laughs> we all laughed about that car, but it was paid for for years. Nothing could harm that car. When we'd have hailstorms, everyone else would run out, and they'd get their car, and they'd pull it under the awning. I'd run out, and I'd position that Civic in the direction of the storm. Because hail damage would have been worth five times more than the car. Never hit it. Couldn't kill that car. Why did you keep it so long? Priorities determine path. Would I like a new car? Yeah, but that wasn't my priority. Cindy and I want to give an ever-increasing percentage of our income to God. We have this crazy lifetime goal over the course of our life. We want to give a million dollars to God. Wouldn't that be awesome? That's something we want. That's a goal. So the priority, what we want, determines our path, what we do. That's why our biggest monthly payment is to God. Priorities determine path. If you don't set priorities first, you just go wherever the path leads you. If you don't have priorities, you'll just run around buying stuff, spending money without a plan. You're like the sluggard in the book of Proverbs. Be smarter than an ant. Proverbs 21.5 says, The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. So plans lead to profit. Haste leads to poverty. The opposite of a plan is haste. What is haste? Do whatever you want, whenever you want, as fast as you can. i got to have it right now. In a hurry. I tell people all the time, a fast decision is a bad decision when it comes to your money. Come on, you're smarter than an ant. Sit down as a family. Determine your priorities and let those priorities determine your path. 
If you want to pit, put your kids through college, determine the path. You say, well, that's not possible. I can never do that. Yeah, you can if you start, start early enough. If you want to retire at age 50, you're going to have a different path. If you want to build your dream home, there's a path. If you want to give more than 10% of your income to God, determine the path. If you want to give a million dollars to God, determine the path. Figure out how many years you're going to live and how many dollars that would be a year and start doing it. If you want to make a difference for victims of human trafficking, then that priority determines your path. When it comes to money, don't just let life happen. Have a plan. At an early age, my parents taught me how to plan. And part of their plan was pretty unique. My mom and dad budget a certain amount of money every month as their generosity money. And that way, if God puts someone on their heart, they don't have to think about where the money will come from. They're able to give. If their church, or for that matter, our church, takes a special offering, they're able to give because they planned ahead to be generous. They give in our special offerings all the time. Not, not by accident. They planned. They set aside money so they could be generous. I call it the Santa Claus principle. The principle of planned generosity. And I am not putting this hat on. I know. First two weeks I wore a hat. Not this time. Now understand... I get that not all of you believe in Santa. Please don't send me emails. I, I'm just trying to teach a principle in a way you and your children can understand. If you don't want to talk about Santa, don't. If Santa Claus offends you, ignore the next five minutes or so. Tune back in when I'm done. Listen to me closely. I don't want emails about Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or any of that stuff. All right? I'm not against it. I'm not for it. I'm neutral. It's a principle and a hat. Okay? I'm not endorsing Santa. I'm teaching a principle. Although Santa, I think he's a fine man doing a fine work. <laughs> Unless you're against him. And then I think Santa's a horrible man who does nothing good at all. <laughs> Santa isn't taken by surprise on December 24th. He doesn't wake up that morning and say, Oh, we've got work to do. We've got a billion people waiting for gifts today. Hey, Mrs. Claus, elves, reindeer, anybody have an idea? No, Santa plans all year long for one big day. Does anybody know what Santa does on February 25th? He's planning ahead because it's just 10 months till Christmas. The Santa Claus principle is the principle of planned generosity. Cindy and I budget generosity. At the end of our budget, we leave a gap so we can respond to God. And if God says, leave that server a big tip, or God says, I want you to bless that family for Christmas, we can do it. It enables us to obey God's voice. When he speaks, we can give. When he directs, we're ready. You say, well, how much do you budget? It changes with seasons of your life. But even if it's only $5, budget to be generous. Even if it's just 5 bucks a month, say, Lord, put somebody on my heart, and God will use that money that you budgeted to be generous, and it will make a difference for someone else. I want to always be ready to give. I want to always be ready to respond to the Lord. Now, since you're a little mad about Santa... Let me take that principle the other direction. And the best example of planned generosity is Jesus. Jesus left the riches of heaven for the poverty of earth so he could give you a wonderful gift, salvation. And you know what? It was a plan. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor. So that you, through his poverty, might become rich. It wasn't an accident. Jesus planned to give his life for you. It's biblical. Plan, plan to make a difference. When we combine those two principles, we talk about your priority, determining your path, 
and we talk about planning for gener generosity. Put those two principles together and you've put yourself in the place where you can obey God long term, what God's put in your heart, and where you can be immediately obedient to God when he speaks to you in the moment. The goal of all this is to position your life so you can say yes to God. You can say yes to his lifetime call. And you can say yes in the moment. When you do, watch how God uses you. Watch how he uses you to make a difference. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to pray for you. Let's just pray together. Lord, we give you our plans. Lord, forgive us when our plans aren't your plans. But I pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts. That you would speak to us about priorities. And that those priorities, what matters most to us, would determine our path. And Lord, I pray for each person listening today that what matters most to you would pay, play a huge part in their consideration. Lord, then I pray that you would help us to be disciplined enough to plan generosity so we can say yes to you. Lord, we, we really do. We want to position our lives in every way so our response every time, every day is yes, Lord. We just say yes to you. Lord, I pray for people who are under pressure financially. I pray for people with crushing debt. I pray, God, that if they, as they apply these principles, you would help them, help them get to a place, Lord, where they can, they can be planned and they can be generous and that you can use them. Lord, I pray for that person who just feels discouraged and they listen to me and think I'll never get there I can never be there I pray God that they wouldn't give in to those feelings of futility but instead they just start taking those steps to obey you and to plan for the future Lord we ask for your blessings and for your help in this part of our life we never want to do this by ourselves and so we we position ourselves for blessings with our obedience, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.